Hi, uh, here for just an update on Seven Fallen Feathers. So I started reading it November 7th. Uh, I was thinking I would do like a little mini reading vlog with it. I'm, I just checked, I'm 36% of the way through now. It's November 12th now. <clears throat> but I was thinking I would do just like a little mini reading vlog because I plan on doing a reading vlog for the Buzzwordathon, which again is numbers, and that's why I'm reading Seven Fallen Feathers, even though I'm reading it prior to the uh, readathon because it's a um, very heavy topic. So um, it's really good so far. I'm 36% of the way through, like I said. Um, I'm enjoying it. It is, like I said, a really hard topic. And there's definitely a part I want to read to you in here and give my thoughts about it. But right now, as you can see, I'm in the car. I just dropped the kids off like 15 minutes late 20 minutes late for school uh and then i go to mops at 10 and it is 9 24 right now so i was planning instead of driving home and then coming back because mops is just across the street from the school i was just going to spend the hour reading in the car but now i have like half an hour just a little bit under half an hour to read um but that's okay um but yeah i was just gonna do a little mini vlog for this and um, I'll read a part in here later on but it is a very heavy topic so it's not like a pleasant read that way but it is really well written and uh, easy easy to read and follow along with uh, it's a little bit of a slower read in the sense that there's a lot of indigenous language like um, just the names of the indigenous people, where they're from, things like that. So, like, for me, I slow down and, like, try and pronounce the name properly, even though I'm probably butchering it. So, it just takes a little bit longer. Like, you can't just skim through it kind of thing. But I'm really enjoying it so far. So, that's just my quick little update on Seven Fallen Feathers. Racism, death, and hard truths in a northern city. So I was going to say, like, I live in Canada. I'm proud to be Canadian. I think we live in a pretty great place, but you learn about some of the stuff that goes on and you're like, wow, this is just terrible. And uh, no matter where you go, there's going to be there's going to be crime. There's going to be things that aren't great, things you don't agree with. Um, a lot of horrible things have happened in the world, around the world and stuff like that. And Canada's not exempt from those things. Um, from some of those terrible things. So yeah, I'll talk about that later when I do another update. But thanks for watching. See you later. You want me to rewind it? It that's part. Oops. Okay, press play. <laughs> it says fire. Is that the part? No. Yep.
This is the part you keep showing me. <laughs> Again. So I think most of this book vlog is going to take place reading in the car. Uh, both my daughters were supposed to have a dentist appointment today to have cavities fixed, but we were running really late, so the one appointment got moved till next week, and then my husband's just inside with our other daughter having her teeth, her cavities fixed, uh, and I stayed in the van because our other daughter's sleeping. We had to get up extra early today for school because my husband actually had a class today. So we had to drive him to the other side of town and then take the kids to school and all that fun stuff. So that's the joys that's the joys of having only one vehicle. Sophie's Sophie's at the dentist. Just waking up now. Uh it's like four fifteen, four twenty or something. Um, but yeah, it's cold, it's rainy. Well it's only min only minus ten right now but it's kind of that slushy snowy rain going on as I just did a clip of the rain outside so it's a perfect time to just want to curl up and read uh anyways I should be done this seven fallen feathers soon um and then I'll record obviously my wrap-up thoughts and stuff about it and the one thing that I wanted to share from the book but yeah Things are going well, and we have a doctor's appointment Monday, but that doctor's really fast, and there's not really a lot of time to sit and wait in the waiting room and read, so that's that's good, but I'm hoping to have this book done by today's Thursday, so I'm hoping to have it done by the end of the weekend, which shouldn't be a problem. Anyways, that's my reading update for now. So this is my first time doing a reading vlog and this is for uh, Seven Fallen Feathers and I've taken a little bit of footage um, of me reading and stuff like that but I know most people do reading updates so I'm a little bit more than halfway through now I'm on page 204. Um, I got one cute little unicorn tab there for um what I want to talk about at the end of the book one of the one of my thoughts on it it's like 11 o'clock at night right now I'm baking banana bread because we had some bananas that went bad and making molasses ginger molasses cookies because they're my favorite and um my husband just went out to a friend who just lives around the corner from here so um just reading while I'm waiting for the banana bread to bake and then we're supposed to read 1984 by George Orwell which is something I'm also doing a little mini vlog for but yeah just wanted to update this is like I said this is really good and it's it's really interesting really well written I'm reading another book um I don't want to talk about like what it's about necessarily or show it yet because I bought it to actually give to my mom, but thought I would read it because it looked like a cute little story. It's it's okay. I'm about halfway through that too, but it's kind of like not holding my interest. We had to go to the hospital yesterday and I was in the van for four hours with the kids, but it was like 9 o'clock when we went, 9 p.m. So, um, they eventually fell asleep in the van and then my husband got out of the hospital at 1 30 in the morning without any results he's like this is ridiculous i'm leaving um so we're just gonna book a doctor's appointment but so i brought the other book not the seven fallen feathers because i was like if the kids are crying and getting upset that we're stuck in the van 
then I don't want a like really heavy book to read. I just want something light. And then I was stuck and they were sleeping for like probably at least three hours of it. And it sucked because I brought such a boring book. Well, it's not boring. It just, I don't know. It's not making me want to, like I'm not that invested in their stories, I guess. It's, it's about three women and they end up opening this business together. And then just their, mostly their stories about dating and relationships and stuff. But, um, yeah, so the reason why I took my husband to the hospital and he didn't just take himself and I stayed home with the kids is because i just been really, like, stressed and had a bad day with the kids. So I was like, I don't want to be left alone for bedtime. <laughs> but also, um, the week prior to that, he took me to the hospital because I was in a lot of pain and ended up having a bladder infection and needing antibiotics. Which I assumed it was a bladder infection. So he drove me because who wants to drive when you're miserable and in pain and all that stuff. And oh my heaven's beeping. And uh, so he just drove me. And it was like 8.20 when I got there. And I got out by like 8.45 p.m. So this time he had been working. It was his last day of work after seven days. And I was like oh you'll be tired. And I'll just drive you to the hospital, drive around a little bit. The kids will fall asleep. No big deal. And you should be in and out pretty quick. But, yeah. Four hours with no results. But they did take, like, a urine sample and stuff from him. He's sinking something along the lines of kidney stone more than a bladder infection. But that's why we need to book with the doctor. Anyways, my banana bread is beeping. So, that's my reading update. This is my dog. His name is Chief. Um... I'll see you later. <laughs> Bye. Hi, uh, I finally finished Seven Fallen Feathers yesterday, so I just wanted to talk about that and do a little bit of a wrap up here. This is my first reading vlog, so it's probably a little bit rough, but thank you for everyone who's watched this far. Um, it's been exciting, and me and my husband are doing a little mini vlog of reading 1984, but we are failing at reading it, but luckily I was able to find the audiobook and download that. So we've listened to a little bit of it on our drives. And um, he goes back to work in, he's got two more days off, not like the rest of today, which is Sunday and then Monday, Tuesday off. And then back to work. So we won't finish 1984 before he goes back to work, but hopefully by the end of the Buzzwordathon. So that's uh, two weeks of reading that book. And then this one I finished like I said, yesterday on Saturday and the Buzz Readathon is tomorrow, which is Monday. So I was able to finish it before starting the Readathon, which I'm also really excited about. And I'm not really going to be on social media so much. Like I'm not going to be watching Netflix or Disney Plus now or YouTube or anything like that. The only social media I'll be doing is updating, like checking Instagram and Twitter and stuff and seeing what other people are doing for the buzzword and I'll be watching their videos after that week and um, the most technology will be 
uh, working. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna do like a daily vlog, but just the vlog for the whole week. And uh, so I might work on some editing stuff, but for the most part, I'm just gonna try focusing on reading because reading more than one book in a week is not something I normally do. And I have some audiobooks I have planned to listen to, which are like really short, like under three hours. So those, I could listen to like one of those a day while I do things like laundry, dishes. Um, I'm working on some crochet projects right now for making a blanket for my daughter for Christmas. Um, so I can crochet and listen to the books. Anyways, I want to wrap this up quickly because it'll be a long video already. And uh, my husband's always talking about I'm a new channel. Um, trying to get an audience and stuff and I should be keeping my videos under like 10 minutes but I talk a lot <laughs> and because I am new I find that I'm like rambling and I my thoughts are kind of all over the place but I'm trying to keep them short but this is a vlog so it'll be a little bit longer anyways uh, so I just wanted to share a couple I put a couple little tabs in the book um, I just wanted to share a couple thoughts about it and I just want to say, like, I know I'm the most majority opinion out there. I'm a white female. I'm straight. I'm married, kids, Christian, like the most typical opinion out there. And I was actually um, coming near the end of this book because this is about racism in Canada and in a northern city in Ontario. And I was just thinking, like, even the... People I watch on BookTube are pretty much all, like, white women in their 20s. So I was like, okay, I need some diversity in the BookTube community as well. So I've gone and looked up a bunch of BookTubers and added a bunch of new people. So I'm really excited about that and seeing the different, um, the different perspectives and stuff that are out there. But I just want to say, like, this book deals with, well, racism, death, and hard truths in a northern city. And... I'm speaking from the viewpoint of an outsider to that. I've never dealt with racism in my life or anything like that. I've never, there's a trigger warning. There is um, a, a small thing I want to talk about that talks about this woman being raped. I've never been raped. I've never been molested or sexually attacked in any way whatsoever. So... Again, I'm speaking from an outsider's perspective, but this is someone else's story that I'm reading from and just kind of giving a few thoughts about it. But yeah, so just that's my little warning before this, my little uh, blurb that, yeah, obviously I'm speaking as an outsider and as a majority opinion, but um, page 135, this talks about, um, not so much racism, but I'll just read it. Um, and there's a lot of, like, indigenous language and stuff, so if that comes up, uh, I'm probably gonna butcher the words but um pick let's see indigenous uh pick angicum first nation um is what they're talking about so in the early 2000s pick was reeling its children were sniffing gas glue and a host of other inhalants causing irreparable brain damage. There was no clean water and no work. The extreme hopelessness and poverty had brought on a suicide epidemic that was devastating this small, isolated community. At the time, it seemed Ottawa was more interested in offering aid to other countries in crisis. In the final days of 2004, the Earth's crust broke apart and shifted deep inside the Indian Ocean off the coast of Samarita, Indonesia, the shock was violent, an undersea mega thrust in geological terms. A sheer force caused the Indian tectonic plate to be subducted or pushed and pulled by the Burma plate. 
Cascades of salty water from the Indian Ocean rose up, creating tsunami after tsunami with massive waves that relentlessly hammered the shores of 14 countries, killing more than 230,000 people. As the new year turned, the might of water could leave its soak on 2005. The might of water would leave its soak on 2005, dominating the year. On the second day of January, Canada's sitting Prime Minister Paul Martin Jr., a lawyer and shipping tycoon and the owner of the prosperous Canadian steamship Lines, sent Canada's Disaster Assistance Response Team, DART, to Sh Sri Lanka to provide fresh water to displaced survivors. They brought food and sent doctors to perform emergency health care. DART is internationally known for, for sending rapid mobile response to disaster areas all over the world. Up to 200 Canadian forces can be deployed at a moment's notice. The team is able to procure, produce up to 50,000 liters of clean water a day and repair any infrastructure. So I think like that is so amazing that we live, we are so blessed to live in a place like Canada, North America. And the fact that we are able to send out and help these people, like I remember this tsunami and everything in the news. And um, I think it's amazing that we can go out and help people all around the world. And I think that's important. And I do believe that we should give aid to other countries and to people that are hurting or even helping people. Like, I don't want to get into a talk about um, refugees and stuff like that and immigration and whatever. But I do believe that we have an obligation as a country that is so rich and blessed to help others. For sure, definitely. But that doesn't mean that we ignore the problems in our own backyard either. And I think about that too because my husband and I have talked about adopting kids. And it's like, do we want to adopt from a foreign country or adopt from Canada? And I think there's need for both. Like, there's children in foreign countries that need um, homes that need families and there's children here probably in our own, very own city that need homes. I know that um, foster care is a huge thing that is needed all around the country and in our province and in our own city. So I imagine just like adopting within the city as well. So that's always something that's on my mind like how can we help other countries as well as helping people in our own city, our own province, our own country. Um, but going on, on one, page 136, the people of Pick had something in common with those in Sri Lanka. Both did not have access to clean drinking water, but Sri Lanka was getting relief from the government of Canada. Pick was not. Over the course of its time stationed in an old Sri, Lanka, Sri Lankan sugar factory, DART would treat 7,620 patients and supply 3.5 million liters of clean drinking water. Pig First Nation sits on about 4,470 acres in the far northwestern reaches of Ontario near the Manitoba border, about 300 kilometers northwest of Winnipeg. Um, and it talks about where it got its name from with a bunch of other words that I cannot pronounce. Um, okay, so it says pick lacks the basic necessities of life. I'm not gonna say that. In 2005, there were roughly 450 homes. Of those homes, 340 did not have running water or proper sewage systems. The tap water was contaminated and most kitchens were built without sinks. People collected water from a communal standpipe hauling it back to their homes in buckets. They drank bottled water, showered and bathed in contaminated water, and most used outhouses, a small wooden shack with a deep hole in the ground. Once the hole was full, you just picked up and moved your shack to another location. Um, so I think it's crazy, like, we had a water main break here, like, a city water break, and our neighborhood was out without water for, like, maybe a day um 
And I remember thinking, like, people are upset. We need water. We need to eat. We need to cook. We need to clean. We need to bathe. We need water. We can't survive without water. And then, like, within a day, it was fixed and everything was fine and we all had water again. And uh, we dealt with a natural disaster here three years ago. And when we came back, there was um, a few issues with the water. And it was, like, kind of like a boil water advisory and maybe drink some bottled water and stuff like that for for the time being um and it's inconvenient to have to boil your water but I mean it's you can just turn on a tap and pour it into a pot and boil your water um it's not like you have to go to the river or to a well or somewhere and like haul buckets of water and then walk it back not even like put it in a truck or something and I was just thinking, like, how upset we would be if we were, like, three, four, five days without water. How inconvenient, how upset, even though we could just drive to the store and buy bottles of water and people in third world countries, in other parts of the world, they don't have that option. They can't just go to the store and buy bottled water because their sewer line is broken or their water line is broken or their pipes have burst or something or... If they do have contaminated water, they can't just turn on a tap and boil the water. They have to go to a well or somewhere. And yet, here we are complaining because our water's out for a day. Or we have to boil water for a week. Or whatever. And it's just, like I said, we need to help people in our own backyard as well as around the world. But these people, these people are in our own backyard. This for this um, indigenous community, the, these First Nations, these these people live here in Canada, and they have no water. Like to me, that's just mind boggling. And it's not like just an inconvenient. The water's gonna be out for the week while we fix some pipes or something. Like this is how they live all the time. And I think, like I said, it's amazing that we can send aid around the world and help people and we've been helped by red cross as like i said we we uh lived through um a natural disaster here and we had help with red cross and places to live and food and shelter and clothing and stuff because we just left with the clothes on our back kind of thing and yeah like how how can we and I know this has been an issue for a very long time and a lot of people talk about it. And if you've ever read the book, The Best Laid Plans, or they have a mini series out as well that me and my husband rented and watched. Um, or downloaded and watched, I don't remember. Um, that also talks about the, the First Nations people, the Indigenous people, not having clean or accessible water. And I definitely think that's something that we need to focus on and help. Like, if we can, this DART, like I was saying, if they can turn and get millions of liters of water to these people and just help them, like, in such a fast, like, a short amount of time, they're just out the door and helping these people. Like, why can't we help the people that have lived here for generations and thousands of years before we were ever here like they are the indigenous people they were they're the first nations <laughs> like they were here first this is their land we're on their land and um we can't even get them clean water like that's so it's just mind-boggling and this northern city is on the other side of the country from where i live in a northern city so if anyone's watching this and lives where i live um and if there's anything, like, that I can do to help the communities around where I live, let me know. Or what we can do or who we can talk to. And what are the, let me know what the biggest concerns are of the First Nations here on this side of the country. And then, um, there was another... Um, one more thing I wanted to read. Oh, this says here on page 267, 
Indigenous communities continue to lack the basic necessities of life, including clean water, safe housing, working fire trucks, basic health care, and access to education. Um, like, I, it's just mind-boggling, really. Um, and this book also talks, obviously, about... Uh, the residential school system and this like the seven deaths happen after that it's between 2000 and 2011 but i also requested a book from the library i think it's called they called me number one which is a story about a survivor from the residential school so i was hoping to have that before or during the readathon but it hasn't come uh, available yet but i'll be reading that this month as well um it's just my like mind-boggling but what's more mind-boggling is the stuff, like, it, that's still continuing to happen to this day. Like, the residential school stuff was horrible and terrible and heartbreaking, but that's... The residential, like, it's not in the past in the sense that people have healed from it, but it's in the past in the sense that those schools have been shut down and we're trying to make strides forward now to, like, help and heal what has happened in the past. But... Then we're still, like it says, they they uh, lack the basic necessities that we would never put up with here, like in this city. We would never put up with um, not having access to water or fire trucks or health care. Like already where we live, as far north as we are, we are, our health care is not the best and we do have to travel south five hours out of the way to get adequate um like we have adequate health care we have emergency here we have reason we do have resources here but we still have to go south for like big things and um major surgeries things like that like they just don't have the resources here but what about the people even further out Right? Like, what about these First Nations? What about the Indigenous communities that lack these basic necessities? I can imagine how frustrating it would be. This is the part that talks about rape. It's not graphic, but... Um, yeah, just a trigger warning, I guess. <clears throat> it's a... Uh, the previous year, on December, and this is on page 269, the previous year, on December 27th, 2012, a 36-year-old mother was brutally raped, beaten, and left for dead on the side of the road. The woman, who does not wish to be named for fear of reprisal, had left her home momentarily to pick up some milk for her kids when a car pulled up beside her, and the occupants began throwing garbage at her while calling her a squaw and a dirty Indian. Then they grabbed her, threw her into the back seat of the car, and took her far out of town. Once in a secluded area, they viciously beat and assaulted her. As they were raping her, they told her she liked it because she was indigenous. They also warned her to keep her mouth shut, but they had done that they had done this before and they would do it again if she said anything. The woman fled Thunder Bay after she saw one of her attackers in the mall with his family. She now lives in Winnipeg. Police say the case, which has been classified as a hate crime, is still open, but no new information has come to light. And I just... Again, rape is one of those things that's just terrible and horrible, no matter who you are, no matter who it happens to. And it happens to men, it happens to women, it doesn't matter what your class is, what your race is, what your social economic status is. Like, it doesn't matter. It happens to everybody and like I just I don't understand the racism and the rape like they're calling this woman a dirty Indian but then they're going and having sex with her like to me it's just mind-boggling like who who does that and like, racism on its own is bad. Rape on its own is bad. But, like, combining the two, it's just, like, I just can't wrap my mind around people who do this kind of stuff. Like, 
who would put up like she said she saw this guy at the mall with his family like does he have kids what if his kids were being bullied at school for something like he wore glasses or had a big nose or something like would he put up with that and like I just don't understand racism at all and I don't and it's heartbreaking to think like this is the mindset people are still having like this happened in 2012 that was seven years ago. Like, it's just, yeah, that that's not that long ago, and it's still happening, and it's, it's just heartbreaking, and my heart goes out to these people, and I've never, like I said, I've never been through anything like that, but if, um, you know, like, if anyone out there just wants someone to talk to, I can, I can listen. I... I can't give you help or empathy in the sense of, like I said, knowing exactly what you've gone through, but I can definitely listen and help you find resources to get you the help that you need. But anyways, this was the book that I read before the Buzzwordathon with the numbers. Um, very, very good book. Like I gave it five out of five stars. Definitely hard hitting, definitely a hard read, definitely heartbreaking, but also very eye opening. And I think it's something we do need to read because I'm very, I know that there's racism out there. You see it a lot online with, um, in the States and like the whole black lives matter and the blue lives matter and the cops killing African Americans and all this stuff. And up here you see it with, because I mentioned to a friend, I was like, I don't, I don't witness racism as much as I'm seeing it on, like, in, in person. I don't witness it the way I see it online. And my friend was saying, like, it doesn't happen here as much with the African American community. It's more the indigenous community up here. And, um, you know, people are always so proud of being from Canada and we're, um, inclusive community and we allow like we're so diverse and it feels like this big pride thing like oh we're such a diverse nation and then you read books like this and you see racism and stuff and you wonder like yeah we have a lot of diversity here but are we really that accepting of it and how can we be accepting of it and show people like that there are those few people out there who are just going to be racist and um, wrong and they need to be dealt with for sure but also that there are good people out there as well and that we can get along and have diversity and have the different voices coming together and working together and um, I know I'm very ignorant of, I don't really see racism happening, like, in front of me, and I don't even know what I would do if I did see it, like, I would hope to think that I would stand up for the person, but you never know until you're in those situations, but, like, yeah, it's definitely eye-opening to see, like, this stuff is happening, and it is out there, and we need to do what we can to change that. So, anyways, please... Comment down below. Let me know what you think, what your thoughts are, what your experiences are, and um, the needs that you see in your own community and what we can do to help people here in our own country as well as those in need in other countries. Thank you so much for watching. I've already talked for half an hour just in this clip alone, so it's going to be a long vlog, but thank you again for watching. and. I'll see you next week with my other reading vlog. Bye!